Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. In our last episode, some of you guys were upset that I made a Democratic primary cannibalism joke. One of the most important topics being discussed right now in the Democratic primary race is the subject of cannibalism and its rise in the United States. Is it a national epidemic or is it just the latest trend in sustainable meat sources? I assure you, I was just using the primaries as a vehicle for a cannibalism joke. Focus more on the cannibalism, because if you know this channel, we're all about non-secular, nonsensical jokes that have very little meaning or substance behind them. I did a cannibalism joke because I find cannibalism funny, and especially when it's not being done to me. But honestly, there are very few things you can make fun of nowadays without offending people, so for those of you who I did offend with my comments in the last video, I apologize. I'm just kidding. But what I will do uh, for the sake of fairness and balance and triggered individuals out there, I'll talk about Trump's White House. Due to the alarming number of whistleblowers emerging out of Trump's White House, the chief of staff of Trump's White House has now made it mandatory for all new staff members to commit bestiality before assuming their new position. Because if you'll voluntarily commit bestiality, you're either a Navi blue monkey or very loyal. Perhaps this is something that all employers can learn from and apply to their own hiring practices. Be sure to just check with your local state laws on animal-human relations. It varies from state to state, and yes, it is a felony in Missouri, but surprisingly legal in Washington, D.C. So I would argue that this is not grounds for impeachment. See, now everyone can be equally triggered on both sides. Now, in our recent video, uh, one of you guys asked me in the comments section, how does Star Wars communication work? And I thought it'd be an interesting subject to research. Here on the Flat Earth, communications is oftentimes taken for granted because the distances are quite short and there is no annoying curve in the planet that makes direct line communication impossible. But in a larger galaxy like Star Wars, which is, by the way, NASA propaganda, there is no wider galaxy just the flat Earth on top of a giant flying tortoise. Anyway, in a larger galaxy like Star Wars, which is several hundreds of thousands of light years across, communication from one planet to another is as big of a problem as FTL travel is. Here on the flat Earth, we primarily use radio waves to communicate with one another. Radio signals are electromagnetic waves that can travel roughly at the speed of light, which is around 186,000 miles per hour or around 10 liters per centimeter in metric. If the world were round, that means one radio signal can make it around the Earth seven times in just a second. Of course, radio beams can't curve all that much. Uh, maybe they can go over a mountain, but if you curve the radio waves a little too much, you'll lose all the information and data being carried by that wave. So if the Earth were actually around, the signal would have to be beamed up to satellites, which could reflect the signal to other satellites in deep space. If space were actually a real thing, which it isn't. So in the Star Wars galaxy, radio waves are most likely still used as a cheap way to communicate. They require low energy and can travel quick enough around a planetary mass to create almost instantaneous communication. But in a galaxy as large as the one in Star Wars, which is estimated to be around 100,000 light years or 10,000 celestial tortoises across in size, a signal traveling at the speed of light is far too slow for communications. Say you were on Jakku and you suddenly were under attack by some masochist race of aliens from another galaxy. If you were to send a radio signal back to Coruscant, it might take centuries before it even gets there. Forget getting rescued or being sent reinforcements, most likely everyone who was alive when you sent the message is now dead. Except for Yoda, who was a Tarsier that was trapped in a microwave for an extended period of time, granting him supernatural longevity. So one of the most obvious ways you can transfer information in the Star Wars galaxy is by using hyperspace. We've done entire videos on how hyperspace and hyperdrives work, but the short version is that hyperspace is an alternate dimension that must be entered by using a device known as hyperdrives. While in this alternate dimension, a ship can travel many times faster than the speed of light, making it possible to travel hundreds of light years in hours or even minutes, depending on the class of your hyperdrive. It's much faster than a crude warp drive, though space commies are so primitive with their old technology. Now, contrary to what most people think, hyperspace travel isn't done by folding space and shortening the distance between point A and point B. You see, the cosmic bodies that exist in the physical dimension also have corresponding gravitational signatures in hyperspace. 
Which is why you can't just hyperspace yourself through a planet or a fleet of peace-loving space fascists with daddy issues. Most hyperdrives have gravitational sensors on them, which will pull a craft out of hyperspace before they slam into some larger object. It's through this principle that interdictor ships work. They essentially have large gravity projectors that mimic a large mass and can force a ship out of hyperspace. Other than that though, sending a message through old-fashioned courier on a very not old-fashioned hyperspace vessel is probably one of the safest ways to get a message through. After Rogue One transferred the Death Star plans from the surface of Scarif to the Profundity, Admiral Raddus decided instead of sending the plans over another form of communication like radio waves or the hollow net, he puts it on a data disk and has it physically sent to the Tanta B4, which was docked on the Profundity. This is immediately after Vader boarded the ship and started doing the Star Wars equivalent of clubbing baby seals to the rebel troopers on board. So Japanese Vader. Anyway, those plans eventually skipped the grasp of Vader once again when he overtook the Tanta V4 in the Tatooine system and made it all the way to Yavin 4 and helped the rebel pilots find the hidden weakness in the Death Star. The reason why Admiral Raddus was afraid of transmitting this signal to the wider galaxy was he was afraid it would get jammed or maybe intercepted. I imagine the fear was that the Empire would figure out what exactly was in the Death Star plans and learn about the hidden weakness that Galen Erso had designed into it. After Tarkin had used the Death Star to demolish Scarif's main archives, any records of those plans would probably be lost. Unless the Imperial archives are very, very annoying and like to make thousands of backups of everything. Had that not been a concern, Raddus would have just used what's known as a subspace transceiver. These were devices that sent and received energy-based communications from one place to another. In short, they most likely worked in the same principle that our own radios here on Earth do. Most regional governments or corporations would maintain a network of these subspace transceivers and deep space satellites in their territory for cheap and reasonably fast communications, as long as it was within the confines of their local solar system. It was by using these type of regional local networks that most citizens of the galaxy were able to stay in touch with each other, get their news and entertainment. Just like here on Earth, individuals or companies could pay fees to have their own individual transmission be sent out, usually ranging from 1 to 20 credits per 10 seconds of airtime, which really isn't that bad of a price. Now, there are hundreds of different subspace networks scattered across the galaxy, and in theory, you could probably patch them together and send a message from one end of the galaxy to another, but it would probably take a pretty long time. And it's also unknown whether they actually use radio waves still in Star Wars. It is possible because they are a more advanced society that they figured out another type of energy wave that moves even faster. More than a decade ago here on Earth, scientists working at the Los Alamos National Laboratory were able to use a polarization synchrotron. No idea what that means, but most likely they took a thingy and placed it in another thingy, spun it, and made it faster. But yeah, we don't really know what kind of energy waves subspace transceivers are using to communicate with. It could be light speed or maybe many times faster than light speed. Now, if we scale down the power and energy used by a subspace transceiver, we have personal comlinks that basically work on the same principle. These are more mobile versions that can be carried around by people. Think walkie-talkies. Now, the range of a comlink or a subspace transceiver really depends on how much energy is used to amplify that signal. A standard comlink was said to have a range of 50 kilometers in an ideal situation. That means line of sight communications, clear atmosphere, no interference from other signals, and so on. It seems like whatever energy wave they are using, it does function in a similar way to radio waves, which makes them relatively vulnerable to cosmic radiation, solar winds, and all other kinds of stuff. Now, for true galactic-wide instantaneous communication, you have what was known as the holonet. This was a massive piece of infrastructure that was equally as important to the Galactic Republic as the hyperspace lane network. The Galactic Republic Senate first approved construction of this galaxy-wide communication grid thousands of years before the Battle of Yavin, and it quickly expanded during the Great Manifest period out of the core into the expansion territory, and eventually on into the Outer Rim. This giant grid was made up of millions and millions of hyperwave transceivers that were actually suspended in hyperspace. You know, that other dimension where the laws of physics work funny and you can travel very quickly? But instead of using the larger hyperspace tunnels that ships travel in, these hyperwave transceivers functioned using S-threads, which were tiny little tunnels that communications could travel through. S-threads required far less energy than a full-size hyperspace tunnel, and because of its low energy signal, it was extremely hard to detect and intercept a communication through S-threads. Although one could easily cut off the signal when it arrives to a location or at one of the many relay points scattered across the galaxy. 
Whether it was the Galactic Republic or a Galactic Empire, they could basically tap into anyone's communication, which is probably why Admiral Raddus didn't use the Holonet to relay the plans for the Death Star. Now, information through the Holonet's S-threads traveled at an incredibly fast speed, and it was even faster than the fastest hyperdrive-powered ships like the Millennium Falcon. This allowed individuals to communicate with each other across the galaxy almost instantaneously. The Holonet, however, was much more expensive than more traditional forms of communication like subspace transceivers. But for people on government business or galactic-wide corporations, it was all a part of the cost of doing business. I imagine in the earlier days, very smart commodity traders in Coruscant would benefit from having Holonet lines to the Outer Rim. Say if the Huts took over the Pike Syndicate's operations on Kessel, if you're the first ones to know about it, this could make you a lot of money betting on spice trading prices. Now, the Republic and the Empire weren't the only factions that developed their own Holonets. During the Clone Wars, the Confederacy created their own Holonet network and called it the Shadow Feed. Having a hollow net of your own legitimized your rule and more importantly allowed you to control information across the galaxy. When Palpatine died, the hollow net was shut down all over the galaxy to prevent the spread of information. Now, there was another form of communication that came from the Legends faction known as the Yu Zhang They used a biogenetically engineered organic machine known as a Villop to communicate over large expanses of space. The Villops grew in pods, and any two Villops from the same pod could communicate telepathically with one another almost instantaneously no matter where they are in the galaxy. Yeah. No one really understands how their telepathy works, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was related to the Force in one way or another. Force users with close family connections could oftentimes sense or even communicate with one another from across vast distances. Which is why Luke and Leia definitely knew that they were brother and sister when they first hooked up. Which is the entire point of Star Wars. Well guys, I hope I answered all of your questions today with our video. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. And as usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.